Well, good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be with you all. I've come a long way from Australia just to be with you this morning. I've just been camping out in Southampton for a little bit in between all of that. But it's great to be able to come across and to be able to open up God's Word and consider this morning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we unpack the scripture that has been read, let us seek the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, our God and our Father, we do come before you this morning knowing that you are the God who speaks, that you are not silent, you are not distant and far from us, but rather you draw near this very morning and you communicate to us from the pages of Scripture. Lord, today would you give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us. For those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus, may we be captured once again by his beauty and wonder. But Lord, if there be any here this morning or listening online who do not know Christ, we ask that this day, Lord, you would save them, that you would bring them into your kingdom, and that you would glorify your name. Lord, please be with me as I preach. May I know the liberty of the Spirit. May I be faithful to proclaim what you would have me to proclaim. And may I make much of Jesus. We pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, recent surveys that have been conducted in this nation have revealed that in this land, in Britain, that once great Christian nation, that a shift of thinking and behaviour has occurred. The religious views, the religious understandings, the faith of this country is now very different to what it was even 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, We live now in a multi-faith and a multi-religion society. And when you live in a society that has multiple views and multiple opinions, what often happens is that people look at Jesus and they consider that Jesus is just one of the many religious leaders of the world and that he is no different to anyone else. And perhaps this morning, as I say that, you would agree and say, actually, that's what I believe. I think Jesus might have been a good man, a good teacher. But what makes him unique? Is he any different to any other religious leaders? Perhaps that's what you think. Perhaps Jesus for you is just a good teacher, a moral man, a prophet, perhaps, but nothing more. Maybe you're in church this morning simply out of tradition, simply out of custom, but you haven't deeply considered the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. You're yet to see his uniqueness. You're yet to see how wonderful he truly is. Well, this morning, I hope that as we come to this passage of scripture, as we come to Matthew chapter 16, I want every single person, no matter who you are or where you're from, to pause and consider Jesus In fact, as we look at our passage here, we see that Jesus, in speaking to his disciples, gives them two questions that are designed to force them to consider who Jesus is. Now, one of the questions that Jesus asks the disciples is very broad, it's very general, it's open. But then he asks the second question, a question that can make people uncomfortable. It's a personal question. A direct question, a question that requires an answer, even from us. Now, these two questions relate to how society as a whole understands Jesus. But the second question relates to how you, as an individual, understands Jesus. So these questions, I hope, make you uncomfortable. It has been said that the role of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted, and afflict the comfortable. And I hope this morning that you are afflicted with these questions because Jesus is unique in who he is and what he says. Jesus is unique in all his dealings and we cannot be indifferent to him. So this morning, let us consider Jesus and wrestle with the teachings and claims of the one who speaks these very words that we consider this morning. Well, let's begin by looking at the two questions. You see that in verse 13 and 15 of Matthew chapter 16. Now, I've already mentioned that these questions are designed for us, but what we need to realize is that the Bible here is actually speaking in a very relevant manner. As I've previously stated, we live in a multi-faith, multi-religion society, 
And the danger is that we can often look outside of this church and go, society is special, it's never been like this before, but that's not actually true. If we could get into a time machine and we could go back in time to the first century and walk with Jesus and his disciples in this passage, we would discover that culture then, society then, is actually very similar to what we see now. Now, technologically, we we far surpass them. But spiritually, morally, religiously, we are very similar to what we see described here in our passage. As we see in the opening words of our verse, that Jesus and his disciples are coming into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, when we read those sort of geographical locations in the Bible, it's easy for us just to keep moving on and say, right, let's get to the question. But the geography that is mentioned here is actually quite important. Because if you could have walked with Jesus and his disciples at that time, if you had entered into the district of Caesarea Philippi with them, you would have seen instantly that that region was multi-faith. It was multi-religion. People had different views and opinions on who God is. As you walk into the area of Caesarea Philippi, you would have noticed that cliff faces surrounded you on one side. And as you looked at those cliff faces, you would have seen that there were carvings made into them. Idols, statues, religious worship. If you're a bit of a history buff, you would have looked closely and seen that the oldest carvings related to the worship of Baal. And you would have known that the people of that culture worshipped that God. But then as you moved along the cliffs, you would have seen new carvings. You would have seen the carving of the pagan god Pan, the god of nature. But then you'd see the newest carvings. Perhaps they were still even working on these carvings as you enter Caesarea. You would have seen that they were making statues of the Roman emperors. You see, in that culture, the Roman Caesars were worshipped as God. In fact, that's why it's called Caesarea. It's named after the Roman emperors. And in that culture, they would have all their worship. They'd have the Baals being worshipped. They'd have Pan being worshipped. But now this new God was on the scene, the Roman Caesars. And the people would go before the statues of these Roman emperors and they would take a sacrifice of incense. They would stand before the Caesar and say, Caesar is God and Lord of me. That's what they would do. It's very similar to our culture, isn't it? People worshipping anything and everything. And that's what Jesus and his disciples enter into. And as Christ comes into this region, as the idols of the nations surround them, Christ turns to his disciples and he says these words. The first question, who do people say the Son of Man is? As the idols look on, Jesus asks a general and broad question. What are people saying about me? Now, it must be noted, Jesus already knows the answer here. Uh, Jesus is not on a fact-finding mission here. We know Jesus knows the answer because in the Gospel of John, we see an account where Jesus says, I don't need people to tell me what others are thinking because I know what's in the heart of humanity. Jesus Christ knew what everyone was saying about him. He knew what people thought about him because he is God. And he knows the hearts of all people. But what he is doing by this broad general question is setting the scene for the next question that's going to come along. The more specific question that's aimed at the disciples directly. The first question, broad. Second question, pinpoint. So Jesus says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? You can almost imagine at that point the disciples start looking amongst themselves. How do we answer? What do we say? And eventually we're not told who, but the disciples answer this general question by saying, well, some say you are John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 
Now, I must admit, when I first read this passage and I was thinking through the answer of the disciples, I thought, that's a strange answer, isn't it? Who do people say Jesus is? Well, Jesus, some of them are saying you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Some over there are saying you're Jeremiah. And then you've got those people who have no idea, they just think you're a prophet. It's a bit of a strange answer, but why would they say that? Why would they give this answer? Well, the reason they give that answer is because that was the common thought that people had about Jesus at that time. In fact, if you go back just a couple of chapters in your Bible to Matthew chapter 14, verse 2, you encounter Herod Antipas. Now, Herod was the political leader of that day. He had John the Baptist beheaded. And when he is confronted with Jesus, Herod revealed that he actually believed in the concept of reincarnation. Because he said, Jesus is John the Baptist, come back from the dead. So that's why they say, some say, John the Baptist, this thought of reincarnation was common in that culture. Then there were those other people who knew their Old Testaments, who knew the the Bible prophecies, and they knew that in the Old Testament there was this prophecy that said before the great coming day of judgment, Elijah would return. So some people said, well, we think that might be Jesus. He might be Elijah. Well, Jesus said he wasn't Elijah, he said that was John the Baptist. But some people thought that. But then there were others who said, well, maybe he's Jeremiah, you know, that mighty prophet of the Old Testament. Maybe that's who Jesus is. Now, why would they give that answer? Well, in Jewish culture and custom, in non-biblical text, the Jews taught that Jeremiah would one day return and that Jeremiah would come and he would overthrow evil, bring judgment and start the messianic age. So some looked at Jesus and said, we've heard what he said. Perhaps he's Jeremiah. Then you had others who just went, we're not sure. We really don't know. Great guy, great teacher, perhaps he's just a prophet. Now what's interesting about all these answers is that all of them are actually quite positive. All of them are saying good things about Jesus. They're all positive answers, but none of them are accurate. None of them are accurate. They are friendly, but they're not true. They all miss the fact of who Jesus really is. They miss the fact that Jesus is truly God and truly man. That he is the long-awaited and long-promised Messiah. That he is the Savior who has come into the world to rescue sinners. They view Jesus in a good sense, but they don't view him in the truth. You see, in many ways, the answers that the disciples mention here, the the answers that are given saying this is what society thinks, actually mirrors what people say about Jesus today. If you ever want an interesting experiment, go out in the streets in this community and say to people, can I ask you a question? Most people say, sure. Sure. Then ask them, who do you think Jesus is? Every single person will have an opinion. Every single person will have thoughts on who Jesus is. If you ask the broad question, who do people say the Son of Man is, you would find that we get a variety of answers like the disciples give here. We would find that people have different views and different opinions. Some would say, well, Jesus is a good teacher. Jesus is a moral leader. One I've heard increasingly of recent days is Jesus is a social revolutionary. He's a good man, a prophet. And you'll hear lots of positive comments. But they're not fully true. They all miss the fact of who Jesus is in truth. But this misunderstanding of Jesus isn't new. The first century, the people misunderstood Jesus. Throughout human history, people have misunderstood Jesus. In the 20th century, the the great thinker C.S. Lewis actually addressed this in his writings. C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he, he had issues with people in his day saying that Jesus was nothing more than a good teacher. Uh, listen to what C.S. Lewis said in response to that common argument. He said, quote, 
Jesus told people that their sins were forgiven. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Oh, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being merely a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You see, when you look at the claims of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, you discover the general answers aren't good enough. Great man, good teacher, wonderful teacher. They all have elements of positive in them. But they're not enough. And if you're here this morning, if if you are perhaps watching online this morning and you're going, well, I think that about Jesus. I think Jesus is merely a good teacher. He's merely a moral man. Then let me just say, you've missed Jesus for who he is. You've completely misunderstood Christ. You haven't seen him in truth. And that's why Jesus now brings the question much more pinpoint. He brings the question down to an individual level. To a level that you and I must wrestle with. Jesus says in the second question, But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? questions just become a bit more awkward now it's easy to hide behind what society says it's easy to put up the general and broad answer this is what people are saying but what about you what do you believe who do you say that i am it's not what is everyone else saying What is the media saying? Not important. What is Westminster saying? Not important. What are my friends at work saying? Not important. Who do you say Jesus is? It's a very direct and confrontational question, but it's a question we need to stop and consider. It is a question that we have to wrestle with because the way in which we answer this question will impact your life, it will impact your family, it will impact your business, your schooling, and indeed, it will impact your eternity. Jesus Christ and his teachings do not give us an option to be indifferent. We cannot sit back and say, well, I'll consider it later, but I have no fixed views. No, we must wrestle with the claims of Jesus. We must look at the question and we must answer We must investigate what Jesus has said and we need to respond to him by acknowledging the truth of who he is and what he has done. There's no middle ground. It's all or nothing when it comes to Jesus. All for Jesus or none for Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Well, to answer that question, we need the Bible to speak and the Bible does. The Bible tells us that Jesus is truly God and truly man. He is the God who created all things and sustains all things. He is the God who made you. He is the God who is compassionate and loving towards you. He is the God who is good and kind. He is rich in mercy and grace, and he abounds in steadfast love. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus taught like no one else ever has taught. He speaks with authority. He speaks the truth. 
the Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He performed miracles and he showed love towards the unlovely. In human history, no one has come close to the majesty and the grandeur and the uniqueness of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who do you say that I am? You see, the Bible declares for us that Jesus is Lord. That is, he is king. He rules over all. He is the sovereign. That is who the Bible says Jesus is. But then the Bible instantly flips it around onto us and says, this is who Jesus is and this is who you are. You've turned your back on that king. You've rebelled against the Lord. You've rebelled against the one who is unique. You've rebelled against the one who is not like any other. Who is Jesus? He is Lord. He is God. He is your master. He is your king. Who are you? You're one made by God to know God. You're loved by God. But you turned your back on him. And ran your own course. We've said we will not have Jesus rule over us. And perhaps you say, Josh, I've never actually said that. I've never verbalized and said I won't have Jesus rule over me. And that's true, you you may not have said that. But actions speak louder than words. And the way in which we live and act shows that all of us, from the youngest to the oldest, from the richest to the poorest, have all declared our rebellion towards the King. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. We don't. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. We don't keep that one either. Instead, you think of self, you promote self, you elevate self, and you often push others down. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yet we lie, we steal, we lust, we hate, we blaspheme God. Who is Jesus? He is King, He is Lord but we rebel against him. And because of that, we deserve judgment and hell. But look again at Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the God of love. He is the God of kindness and mercy. He looks down upon us and he sees us in our sin. He sees us in our rebellion. He sees that we deserve death and judgment, but what does he do? He enters into our existence. He lives amongst us. And he goes to the cross. And he dies in the place of sinners. He takes the punishment that we deserve. And then three days later, he rises again from the dead. And now Jesus, as the conquering king, holds out his hand of mercy towards you. And says there is complete and total forgiveness in him. No matter who you are or what you've done, no matter the guilt and the shame of the past, Jesus says you can have a new beginning. You can be completely forgiven if you would repent and trust in him. Who is Jesus? Well, he's all that and more. And we should hear that and we should believe the truth. We should hear these truth claims about Jesus and move beyond mere intellectual belief. We should move beyond mere intellectual belief and come to the point where we actually personalize it. Where we as individuals hear the truth of Jesus and what he has done. And we as individuals answer the question, but who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what mum says about Jesus. Doesn't matter what your husband or wife says about Jesus. Doesn't even matter what the preacher says about Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? Who do you say that I am? Oh, it's a direct and confronting question. It's a question we have to answer. And Jesus has said it to his disciples. 
How do they respond? Well, look at the answer in verse 16. We know from the Greek construct of this question, the question is broad to all people. The question is, who do you all say that I am? He's asking all his disciples, who do you say that I am? But only one speaks up. Perhaps he's speaking up because he's being a bit of the spokesman for the group. But only one answer is recorded in Scripture. Peter steps forward and he answers by saying these words. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now let me just for a moment pause here and say this. Christ is not the surname of Jesus. It's not Jesus, first name, Christ, second name. That's not what's going on here. No, the title here, Christ, is a positional title declaring that Jesus is King. That he is the anointed Messiah. So when Peter says, you are the Christ, what Peter is saying is, you are king over all. You are the anointed one. You are Lord. You are the one that the prophets spoke about. You are the one that all of Scripture points towards. You are the Christ. But then Peter goes a step further. He says, you are the Christ. But then he makes a statement that separates Jesus from every other religious leader. He says, Jesus, you are the son of the living God. Picture the scene. They're coming into Caesarea Philippi. All around them is what? Statues, idols, false gods carved into stone. Gods who were dead. Gods who were useless that couldn't hear the cry of the people. Statues that if they were knocked over would require someone to come and pick them up. They're deaf, blind and dumb. Yet Peter says, you're not like any of them. You are the son of the living God. God is not dead. He is living. And as such, he interacts with humanity. He interacts with us. He cares for us. He loves us. He draws near to us in our pain, in the darkness and in the trials. He is there. And Peter points at Jesus and says, that's who you are. That's who you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, what we have here is a confession of faith and allegiance. Another way you could put this statement is what we have here is a statement of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Confession and allegiance. Peter is saying, we believe Jesus is who he says he is. We believe and submit to him. He's doing what we all need to do. He knows of Jesus. He knows what Christ is about. And he says, your Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put my faith in you. You will be my king. And that, in essence, is what we all have to do. When we are confronted with the truths of Jesus Christ, and we see who he is and what he has done, when we see the depth of our sin and see that Jesus alone has the words of eternal life, what we need to do is go to him and say, you are my Lord. I'm turning from my sin, and I give my allegiance completely to you. I have faith in Jesus you. And the Bible says if you do that, you'd be forgiven. You'd be made brand new. The guilt and shame of the past will be done away with. Not by what you have done, 
but by the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. Who do you say that I am? The question was given to the disciples, and they answered. And the question is given to you. How will you answer? How will you answer? Will you answer with the disciples by making a confession of faith and allegiance towards Jesus? Will you repent and believe in Christ, the one who is God, the one who died and rose again, the one who loves you and will forgive you? How will you answer? Again, you cannot be indifferent towards Jesus. It's all for Jesus or none for Jesus. What will you do with Christ this very day? morning what will you do with jesus right now how would you answer that question who do you say that i am this very moment if you are here this morning and you've never trusted in jesus you've never repented then today i plead with you come to jesus christ this very morning trust in him Call upon him and he will rescue you. No matter who you are or what you've done, no matter how great your sin may be, Christ knows about it already. He loves you already and he's willing to forgive you. But you must come to him. Would you do that this morning? This morning, right now, where you're sitting, would you answer the question of who do you say that I am by saying, Jesus, I believe you are Lord You died for me, you rose again. I trust in you alone. Would you say that this day? Would you trust in Christ? Would you cry out to him for forgiveness of sins? If you do, he will hear and he will answer. But perhaps you hear and you say, well, I I just, I don't know. I need more information. Well, if that's the case, come and chat to me after the service. Talk to me or talk to one of the church leaders guarantee you will be more than happy to point you to the saviour who rescued us and since he can rescue someone like me i guarantee you he can rescue you so as we finish this morning hear the question and consider the answer but who do you say that i am simon peter replied you are the christ the Son of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word this morning, that you confront us where we are and you call on us to acknowledge you, to turn from our sins and turn to you. Lord, this day, may those who Uh, either here or listening online who don't know you, may they be confronted by the claims of Jesus and may they trust in him. But for those of us who are already saved, may we rejoice in our saviour once again and say, indeed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh Lord, would you have your way and be glorified, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.